actually giving her money to take off. I knew Scott was in contact with her, taking her to and from work. I knew that he um, worked for the FBI. Does the idea of a criminal becoming a trusted FBI agent sound surreal? The story of Scott Kimball will burst the bubble for you. Belonging from a broken family, Kimball had found refuge in non-violent crimes. By the time he was 36, Kimball had become an FBI informant and a serial killer. Welcome or welcome back to True Stories, join the family in exploring some of the most interesting true crime cases. As always, don't forget to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe. Now, let's get into it. In 2000, Kimball encountered the prison for the first time. Soon, he was released and fled to Alaska. To ensure that his identity stayed anonymous, Kimball started living under the name of his brother Brett. With a new identity, Kimball found every reason to become involved in check fraud. After stealing $4,500, Kimball was finally issued a warrant and arrested. This end was in fact, just a beginning. Locked up in prison, Kimball churned ways to escape his bad luck. He was a 36-year-old weathered man, yet sufficiently clever for his benefit by this time. In 2002, one of the FBI agents, Shelf, got to know that Kimball had the news of a murder plot up his sleeve. This included four targets, the federal judge, prosecutor and two witnesses. While spilling this in front of the agents, Kimball also pitched an idea I would be willing to do some undercover work for you guys Kimball knew the weak spots of the FBI, and just the proper techniques, to earn the agents trust. If one murder plot was not enough, he dropped another bomb. While the agents were trying to absorb Kimball's first confession, he added details about another murder plot. This was about an Alaska prisoner, Jeremiah Jones, who was assumed to have murdered an assistant U.S. attorney in Seattle. The FBI found his demeanor convincing, and he was transferred to FCI Englewood in Colorado. Followingly, all warrants against him were discarded. No record of violent crimes was found, and after six months, Kimball was activated as an FBI informant. FBI was yet to find that this was not the best decision. Throughout his time with the FBI, Kimball continued to supply useless and exaggerated information. None of his contributions worked in the FBI's favor. Meanwhile, he was still involved in cashing bad checks, and this time around started financing his business with these checks. The authorities were once again after Kimball, now an FBI informant. However, to their surprise, Kimball had strategically fled away. Following this betrayal, the FBI instantly reassigned Shelf, who took this criminal on board. His impression of Kimball was he was a typical wise guy rigorous FBI investigations started going behind Kimball's record. As it turned out, this wise guy was a little too smart for the forces. Meanwhile, Kimball conveniently hooked up with a 25-year-old waitress, also the first in line, to become a victim of his insanity. Under the pretense of love, Kimball convinced her to buy him a rifle, since he could not get one in the capacity of a felon. No one saw the young waitress again. As old warrants against Kimball surfaced, the police discovered a long chain of ambiguous disappearances. Another astonishing discovery was the disappearance of Leanne Emery, a girlfriend to one of Kimball's previous inmates. This inmate had been turned to the police by Kimball for an escape plan that Kimball had laid out. He was the mastermind yet escaped. In 2002, when Kimball got in talks with Emery, he involved her in a never-ending chain of scams. After a year of cashing bad checks and stealing, the two set out for a road trip to Mexico. Emery's family thought this was just another casual getaway, yet it turned out to be the last they saw of their daughter. $15,000 worth of checks were stolen on this trip to Mexico. Once his goal materialized, Kimball did not think twice about shooting his partner, Emery. Her body was found in a box canyon in Utah. Kimball once again left the crime scene unharmed. It seemed like Kimball had developed some gruesome obsession with murdering people, especially girls. The next girl on his radar happened to be the girlfriend of another inmate. Jennifer Markham became the third unfortunate target of this American serial killer. She was a 24-year-old high school dropout working as a stripper at the time. Exploiting her precarious financial position, Kimball drew another luring web of lies. He claimed to have opened a chain of coffee shops and offered her a job in Seattle. Markham, who was already trying to make sense of her unstable life, found this as an optimum offer, and soon shifted her belongings to Kimball's home. Little did she know that she had stepped into the territory of a bigoted serial killer. Markham was never seen again. The last trace left of her was the presence of her car near Denver Airport. Her father could not deal with his daughter's disappearance, and pressed for thorough police investigations. These investigations connected the police with a strong lead, Joe Snitch. 
The informant claimed to know the location of Markham's dead body. While the forces saw him as a helpful informant, Markham's father was not buying Joe's claim. During one of the meetings, he recorded Joe's car's number plate. This proved to be a turning point in Markham's murder case. With the help of his police acquaintances, Markham's father urged for an investigation about Joe. After a long chain of connections, what emerged was a mind-boggling discovery. Joe Snitch was not an informant, but Scott Kimball under disguise. Before the police could get a hold of Kimball, he escaped again. Kimball's last target became a 19-year-old girl, McLeod. In 2003, after escaping all arrests, Kimball met Laura McLeod and her daughter Casey. Ever since day one, Kimball has had his eyes on Casey. One day, he planned a drug accusation around Casey. He handed Laura a bag of drugs, and claimed to have found it in the 19-year-old's room. Casey stormed out of the house, infuriated at this, only to never step back again. Under the mask of a caring man, Kimball booked Casey a hotel, and took up the task of picking her up, and dropping her back to work. This was another successful attempt to draw out a convincing trap for her murder. It was no coincidence, that the day Casey went missing, Kimball also happened to be on a hunting trip, and went away for a work trip right after. Investigations later revealed that Kimball had murdered Casey, and buried her in a national park. Another layer of horror added to the case when it was found, that Kimball had taken Casey's mother to honeymoon in the same national park, just feet away from Casey's burial site. After years of escaping any arrests, 2008 proved to be the fateful year for Kimball. He was jailed for check fraud, and became a key suspect for at least four mysterious disappearances. Despite scrutiny and investigations, Kimball refused to confess to any murder. Instead, he tried to trick the police by twisting, and turning his claims. In the process of dropping confusing hints, Kimball ended up giving a clue, that marked the end of his compulsive killing streak. What if one of the girls simply disappeared in a national forest the police refused to brush away from the statement? They connected the dots back to a receipt found in Kimball's residence. This was not an ordinary receipt. It was for a grocery store near the Route National Forest, the same forest where Casey had been murdered and fed to the earth. With the final nail in the coffin, Kimball eventually admitted to the murders. Police could locate two victims' bodies, and one remains abandoned somewhere. The serial killer was sentenced to life imprisonment, and continues to rot in Florida. The FBI still refuses to comment on years of unknowingly protecting a ruthless serial killer. We've come to the end, don't forget to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe. Till next time.